Good morning, church. We're glad you're here joining us on this Memorial Day weekend. We love you. We're glad you're joining us. And wherever you're at, we want you to participate with our singing. The lyrics are up on the screen. And we have some great songs today to lift your spirits and help lift our praises to the Lord. The first one's called Take Us to the River.
dedicate my life to you, unto you. God, you're faithful and you're good and true.
We are so glad you're here with us this morning, worshiping. Um, a couple of verses out of the Psalms uh, says, O oh Lord, you are my rock of safety. Listen to my prayer for mercy as I cry out to you for help. I lift my hands towards your holy sanctuary. And in Psalm 119, a couple of verses say, happy are those who obey and search for him with all their hearts. It says, I have tried my best to find you. And lastly, my eyes are straining. My eyes are straining to see your promises come true. And as we, as we worship together, and really as we spend every minute of every day just think about how, how it would be if, if everything we're doing is straining and reaching and searching for God to know him better and to love his word to love his word so much that we're just obeying every drop of it regardless of how we feel we just love God we just want to search and find him and we know the other verses in the Bible says, draw me, draw near to me because I'm close. And so it's one of those things where I just want to encourage us uh, to, to lift our hands, to reach out to God. I mean, even physically reaching out to God and searching for him and, and straining to see him, straining to see his promises come true, straining, right? Making effort. Oh, Lord, we just want to say we love you and we just love to sing your praises and and it's so strange to be spread out all over the place and watching on our computers or our uh, cell phones or our TVs and we aren't together yet uh, but Lord we can all understand your word together and we can all worship you together in unison in unity as we strain to see you as we stretch to reach for you as we put our own desires behind us but our eyes are fixed on you in these uncertain times Lord we just want to fix our entire attention upon you and so as we continue to worship Lord we are hungry for you, Lord. We're hungry to know you, to know your wisdom and your insights that you have for us and to just walk with you every day. We're hungry for that. And we love you and we, we humbly, humbly come to you today, reverently come to you today, saying we love you and thank you for your forgiveness of sin. Thank you for loving us and adopting us as your sons and daughters, as your daughters and sons, as your family. We love you. We love you, God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing one more song on this Memorial Day uh, weekend uh, before we do a few more things. And, and this song is called We Are Hungry. And Lord, I want more of you. And, and uh, I just thought about, uh, um, you know, if that's not really your heart, maybe right now you can just kind of pause and maybe not even sing, but just say, God, I want to be hungry for you. Like, you know, what it's like when you don't eat and you're hungry for a, a big burger or a steak or, or something. We're really hungry. 
or thirsty, you know, out in the desert and you're going to hike or whatever and you're thirsty, you're out of water. Say, God, I, I, I'm not sure what that even means, but I want to be hungry and thirsty for you. I want to be able to reach out and touch you and strain to see you and to know you. So we're going to sing the song and just whatever you're doing, I want you to connect somehow with God, whether singing or praying or pondering these words. Okay, we love you. Let's sing the song together. together. Here we go, church. Lord, I want more of you. Living water rain down on me. Lord, I need more of you. Living breath of life, come fill me up. We are home.
loves to hear our praises. Amen. Right now, we're going to roll a video uh, for the special Memorial Day. Let's go ahead and roll that. Watch the soldiers marching by It was Veterans Day and he wondered well, There were tears in Daddy's eyes Later they laid flowers Beside a monumental stone He said, son, my daddy went to fight Falling, not forgotten. He was a hero. He stood so tall and forever who he will remember with honor and glory. He gave his all. that have fallen while serving our country. We'll have a moment of silence and then I'll close us in a prayer.
We're thankful, God, for our freedoms, and we do seek your blessing in these uncertain times. But we can come around this day with thankful hearts. Um, you have allowed blessings and given blessings over this country, and we are far from perfect, but we are so blessed. And it's at this moment we say thank you. And as we honor and remember those who have served in our armed forces, we are grateful for their service. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm the lead minister of Southeast Christian Church, and again, we are just grateful that you are here. And as we look in, your, in the Word today, um, I just want to start off by, by saying this. Man, we live in a culture of fear, don't we? I, I don't know about you, but it, it seems that fear is what is driving all of our news media. Fear is what's driving a lot of our decisions, and I don't know that God ever intended us to live in fear. And, and here's the thing, is it, it's okay to get scared, it's okay to be afraid, it's okay to have fear, but to live in fear is different. And there are different things where people get afraid of, and, and I don't know about you, but maybe some of, maybe some of this is the cause of your fear, the misinformation that's out there. Maybe you're hearing things and, and you don't know that it's not true. I, I want to encourage you, when, when you read an article online, if you would just make sure that what you're reading is accurate, that it's from a credible source. Because a lot of times we read things online or we hear things in the moment and we come to find out later that there was no validity to it. That there was no, no sense of truth at all in that statement. Um, maybe we're afraid of things that we can't see. You know, right now, I think that a lot of us are not living in fear. We're, we're actually living recklessly, the opposite of fear, because we can't see this virus. And maybe if you're watching this service from a place where it hasn't hit hard, maybe you're watching from Salt Lake, maybe you're watching from, you know, one of these areas that's not a hot spot, you might not be taking this virus seriously because just haven't seen the devastation that it's caused. So sometimes we're afraid of things, but, but, but on the other side is that, that idea that, man, I can't see it, so I'm going to be terrified of it. And so there's kind of this balance that we're trying to figure out as we navigate this, this culture of fear that we're in. Sometimes we're afraid of, of things that are bigger than us. 
Maybe, maybe you have taken this time, this quarantine time, to, to step into your prayer life deeper. Maybe it's allowed you to shed off some of the things um, that have been distracting you from the call that God has for your life. And you know that God wants you to do something. You know that God wants you to step forward in faith. Yet maybe it's just too big for you. Maybe it's you're looking at that step and you're thinking, God, that's so much bigger than I ever dreamed of. And, and fear has taken over. Maybe, maybe something that's stronger than you. Maybe you fear something that's stronger than you. Maybe you look back in the history of your family. And you've seen the continual health issue. Or maybe you've, can, you've seen continual relationship issues. And as you're looking back, you're thinking, man, God, there's all this weight. There's all this pressure that's kind of surrounding my life right now. And it's just fearful. It's just a sense of fear that bubbles up within us. Maybe it's things that you just don't understand. Maybe, maybe it's that you're looking at the situation that you're in and, and it's a takeover with a company or, or maybe it's something else. But you're looking at the situation and you're saying, God, I don't understand anything that's going on. And, and it just creates a sense of fear within your heart. I think that another thing that we fear is things that we can't control. I, I joke all the time, but my, my kids are young. They still live under my house. They still live under my roof. But for those of you that have sent your kids out, there's no control. There's praying. But a lot of times that creates this fear. What is your oldest getting into? Does your youngest still have a job? How's the marriage between the middle? See, when we lose control, the, there's only one place to go is to God in, in prayer. And if we don't go to God in prayer, then we're stuck with fear. I think that the biggest thing that we fear the, mo the, we fear the most, though, is death. The afterlife. We're going to navigate through some of these, but, but here's some things to remember. Again, it's okay to be scared. It's okay to be afraid. But I don't believe that God wants us to live in fear. And, and here's why. Because a person who allows fear to enter their heart and to sit there is a person that's controlled by fear. And I'm confident that God doesn't want you to be controlled by fear. Fear cripples and immobilizes a person. When you, when you let fear sink into your heart, you just stop. and Everything is kind of on pause for you. At least that's the illusion. But you and I both know that we can't stop time. And so when fear paralyzes us, instead of stepping into the plans that God has for our lives, we allow life to hit us. I don't think that God wants that for you. I, I think that God wants to use you as an instrument for his kingdom. Fear immobilizes people. Fear is a tool of the devil. The father of lies. Fear is a tool of the devil. Those who allow fear to dominate will, will never move forward. You see, a lot of times when we have fear. Maybe, maybe you're getting ready to go to college next fall. Maybe you're looking at your life and you're saying, hey, I need to make this decision. Do I go to a, a four-year undergraduate? Do I go to tech school? Do I? And, and maybe it's not that. Maybe it's a, a relationship. Maybe it's a, do I ask her to marry me? Maybe it's a, is now the time that we start trying to have a child? Maybe, maybe the fear is this. Maybe it's, it's, is now the time for a job change? And the problem is, is that when we are immobilized by fear, we can never move into those things. So we just continue to wait and wait and wait and wait. And you know what happens? Nothing. Nothing. 
Here's one of the major, major issues with fear, though. Fear is contagious. I think as a parent, one of the most important things that my wife and I have done over the last few months of this, of this quarantine is, is be responsible. Um, certainly practice the social distance. We, we wear a mask. It's not out of fear. It's simply out of loving our neighbor. But, but here's the thing is that while we've been educated or trying to decipher what's political and what's fact, but one of the things that we've done is we've, we've not allowed this to overcome us. We've, we've not allowed it to, to paralyze us. And it's contagious. And, and one of the reasons for that is because we have kids living at home. You know, I suspect that most of you who have kids at home, they're probably not going to remember a lot of the, the details of this virus. To be honest with you, they, they probably won't remember what the, the president says or what the governor does. But you know what they will remember? They'll remember how you reacted. If you react with a sense of peace, with a sense of hope, or if the world is coming down. And see, I don't think that God wants us to live that way. To live with a heart of fear. I think that God calls us to be courageous. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why we have the book of Hebrews. Remember, this book was written to a culture, uh, a, a group of Christians who were being persecuted. It was a culture against the church. It, it some of the stories that we have before Jerusalem was destroyed is that Caesar would take Christians and he would throw them to the throw them to lions. He, he would take Christians and he would dip them in oil and light them on fire to light his garden at night. And, and I think that the author of Hebrews is writing to say, you know what? Yeah, there is a lot of uncertainty in the world right now. But you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to live in fear. It doesn't mean that you go and live recklessly. But I believe that it means that God is for you. In fact, he, he writes, in, in these uncertain times, in these uncertain times, whatever you do, don't let go of Jesus. Don't let, don't let go of Jesus. And, and he goes on and he begins to expand on this, this, this thought of not letting go of Jesus. Jesus is your deliverer. He will see you through. You, you can trust him. Just as Jesus, just as God delivered the Israelites out of slavery, out of bondage, out of Egypt, God will deliver you. You might not see a way, but God sees a way. You don't need to live in fear. In these uncertain times, Jesus gives you rest. I know it, it might seem like the world is just on fire right now. And, and as we get deeper and deeper into this virus, as we're trying to figure things out, the, the, the voices are just coming at you from all different angles. When you turn on your internet, when you drive down the road and you're listening to the radio, when you talk with a friend on the phone, when you get the, the blast from the email chain, all these different voices, how do you, and, and, and Jesus promises his people, he says, I will give you rest. I will give you rest. Not only that, Jesus gives you help. Jesus gives you help in your, t in, in your time of need. And beyond that, Jesus sustains you with His Word. And that was the challenge last week, is that we, we looked at what the author was saying, and the author was saying, hey, you, God intends for you in this season to grow deeper in your faith, to mature in your faith. And this doesn't mean some secret insight. What this means is that he wants to have a deeper relationship with you. If you think of your spouse or you think of your girlfriend or boyfriend or whoever it is, and when you first get to know them, you're, you're attracted to them. And little by little, over time, you begin to know them more and more and more. And that's what God wants with you. You see, when we surrender our lives to Christ, a lot of times what happens is that we are in the pit. And somehow, some way, um, whether it's somebody that's introduced us to him, or maybe it's something from your past, but 
but we recognize like we need Jesus in our lives. And so we say, God, I need you. I, I confess. I repent. You know, we, we get baptized and we get buried with Christ, resurrected to walk in new life. And here's the most incredible part of that. That's just the beginning. That God takes his Holy Spirit and he seals you with his Holy Spirit. And he wants you to grow up in him. So that when you face trials, when you face uncertain times, you will succeed. And not success in terms of the world. But that you will have success in terms of the kingdom. God wants that for you. And so here's the question though. This is the question that we're going to deal with today. How do I know that I can trust God? I mean, God has said all these things. I mean, God has said, um, you know, that He will deliver me. God has said that He will give me rest. God has said that, that He will give me help in my time of need. God says that He doesn't want my relationship with Him to be stagnant, but He wants me to, to grow up in Him. So how do I know that's true? Psychologists tell us that, um, and it doesn't take a psychologist to recognize this, but a lot of people will base their relationship with God on their Father. There might be some of you who have a broken relationship with your father. And you're looking at God and you're saying, God, how can I trust you? And my father walked out on my family. My father walked out on my mom and my father abandoned me. How can I know that it's true when, when God, I've been following you and my marriage just blew up? I was, I was walking with you, Father, and, and all of a sudden I find out that my wife was having an affair. God, how can I trust you when everything I held precious, when, when you took them from me? How do you know that you can trust God? And I, I believe that's a valid question to ask. I think that's why the author of Hebrews answers it. You see, here's the thing is that we go into business, we go into um, mortgages, we go into all sorts of um, all sorts of relationships, business relationships, casual relationships, and it's built on trust. And the question is, is how can I trust you with my mortgage? How can I trust you with my heart? How can I trust you with this, you know, car loan or whatever it is? And I think that that's what the author was getting at is he gives all these huge promises. And he says, here, here, I, look, I know it's hard to understand. I know it's hard to see this, but here is why you can trust God. Here is why you can trust God. So if you have your Bible, turn with me. To Hebrews chapter 4. Or, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 6. And in Hebrews chapter 6, here's how he starts out. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. You see, God made a promise to Abraham, and we can see that it was fulfilled. In other words, God has a track record. Now for the Israelites, at this time as this was writing, as the author was writing to the nation of Israel, they would have known Abraham, they would have known Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and David and all of the Old Testament patriarchs. And they would have recognized that that's true. That's true. God took Abraham out of the land of the Chaldeans, out of Ur, and he took him to the promised land. And he was without child. He, didn't, he wasn't expecting a child. He was beyond age. And God said, I will make a nation out of you. 
In fact, your descendants will be so many, Abraham. When you look up at the stars, look how many you'll have. As the author was writing to the nation of Israel, he was saying, look, you can look around and you can see that it's right. God kept his promise. We can do that, and if, if you're a Gentile like I am, I can see that. I can see that God established the nation of Israel and he has caused it to, to grow. That Abraham's descendants are more numerous than the stars. But even, not, even if you don't take that, I suspect that if you look back in your life, you will see that God has sustained you in certain moments. As you were going through trials, as you were going through tribulations, as you were looking for something to hold on to, I suspect that after getting through the trial, you would look back and you would say, you know what, it was God that carried me. You see, it's a promise. You can look at God's track record. But here's the other part, and I think that this is a difficult part of a promise. This is a difficult part, is this, this idea that comes in the very next verse. It says this, saying, verse 16, he says, or verse 15, he says, And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. There was a waiting. You see, that's what it's so hard. I think that's where a lot of us get sidetracked when we're waiting on God. We want things immediately. I, I get so frustrated with our internet at home. We don't, we don't have the fastest internet. But isn't it light years better than, we were on, than when we were on dial-up? Do you, any of you out there remember the, the AOL uh, disc that you would get in the ma- in the mail, and you would log on, and you would hope that you would get through, but oftentimes it would come up busy. You see, we want gratification now. We we want to we want our burger now. We want it our way right away. We want everything immediately. I, I think one of my favorite scenes in a movie was that movie Gran Torino. And it was about this older gentleman that was mentoring a younger, a younger, young adult man. And this young adult man gets into this guy's garage and he, he opens it up and there's tools everywhere. And the young man says to, to Clint Eastwood's character, he says, where did you get all these tools? And Clint Eastwood just looked at him and he said, it took a lifetime. It's just a little bit tell you one of the best testimonies that we have of this is marriages that have gone the distance i think a, a lot of people that I, I have come to love over the years and i look at their marriage in 50 years or 60 years or however long and it's it's withstood the test of time that didn't happen immediately that took years of trials Tribulations of fights, of money issues, of child rearing issues, of all these different things. And it's only through going through those trials, only through the test of time, only through patience that you get to experience the love that, that comes through a long marriage. So we, it's this promise that we can look back on God, but it's also this patience that happens. But here's the thing. Look at this. I, I love this. It's personal with God. Look at verse 16. He says, For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is a it's final confirmation. He sees it. What he's saying here is, is, you know, other people swear by things that aren't theirs. Maybe you've said this, I swear on my mother's grave. Or, or maybe, maybe you've taken your Bible out and you've said, I swear on the Bible. Well, that's great, but neither of those are yours. He alluded to it earlier in the first verse that God swears by himself. Because he has no one else that he can swear by. 
And that might seem a little odd, but when you look at it, it means that it's personal. It means that God's putting his backing on it. That God is the guarantee of this promise. You and I, we worship a God who cannot lie. In verse 18, though, we, we recognize, though, that God's promises are not only come by his track record, not only come through patience, not only come through with a personal guarantee by God, but God's promises come with power. They come with power. Look at what it says here in verse 18. In verse 17 and 18, it says this, So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of His purpose, He guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who had fled our refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. So the two unchangeable things are the, the oath that God, ta- that, that God took, but not only that, that God cannot lie. It's in self-imposed limits on the sovereignty of God. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about the things that God cannot do? I am often reminded of the, the saying, can God make a rock so large that he himself cannot lift it? I prefer the other side of it, though. It's, can God make a burrito so large that he himself cannot eat it? But here's the thing about that, is that God imposed limits on his power. Look at what he does. Um, he Imposed by his character. In other words, he won't let you down. It means that he cannot lie. He, he cannot contradict himself. There are some other limits, too. We see it in the, the creation that God cannot walk away. He cannot take a day off. i got to tell you, when, when I'm thinking about a promise of God, and I'm thinking about Him fulfilling it, I don't know about you, but it's comforting to me knowing that God will not walk away from His creation. It's comforting to know that there won't be a time where God comes back and He says, oh, I'm sorry, I was taking a phone call And your promise, I I can't fulfill it because I was away. No, that's not how it works. God never sleeps. God is always watching. God will never abandon you. Which leads to the next one by His character, His creation, and His covenant. God will not abandon His people. And in the next coming chapters, we'll get into a better covenant than the Levitical priesthood. But here's what it means. When you surrender your life to Christ, God takes His Spirit and He seals you with it. He marks you as His own. He says, you are mine. I'm not going to lose you. This one is mine. How comforting is that to know? But but here's the thing, and and that's the ingredients of the promise, but what is the promise actually? Here's the promise actually. Here's what it says in in verse 19. It says this, this, We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters in, to the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf having become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek an anchor for the soul we have the ingredients of the of the promise of what a promise is from God it comes with his track record it comes with um, you know, having patience as that promise unfolds. It comes with a personal guarantee by God Himself, the Creator of the universe. But it comes with power. And, and what is that we get, to, we get to experience? It means that we get to experience an anchor for our soul. 
Man, do you ever feel like this world is just tossed about? Maybe you've had friends with them. Maybe you've gone through seasons with, with this in your own life where it just feels like whatever the trend is, that's where they go with. I always find it funny. I, I always check to make sure right now there's no sports on TV. There's NASCAR. We're, we're hoping for the NBA to come back. But one of the things that I like to do is after a championship is won, I like to go to the ESPN website or Fox Sports or some of the websites that track sports. And usually the day after there's a championship, they're on the front page. The front picture is of the winning team. You know what's on it the second day? Whatever. Because those championships that are won are fleeting. See, I think that a lot of times we, we look at this world and we're just tossed about by the winds and the waves. By whatever's popular at the moment. But God tells us, He assures us that our soul is not that way. Because He is an anchor for our soul. You know, something that I do, and I don't know, it's kind of just something that I've been doing. And I would encourage you to do the same, but I have this pattern that I do in the mornings. I get up and I exercise and I eat something. And then I sit down and I open up Scripture. And I just take some time to, to read a few verses. It's not a lot. But before I turn on my email, before I answer the, the, the pressures of the day, I just want to dig in and to, to see something that stood the, tis, the test of time. I want to put my mind on something that's eternal. I want to put my mind on something that's not driven by whatever the latest data says or whatever the latest popular, popular thing is out there at the moment. I want to put my eyes and I want to sink my heart into something that is eternal. Jesus says that He is the anchor of our souls. And in this, because He is the anchor of our souls, He has access to the Holy of Holies. He, is the, he has access to the Holy of Holies. That means that He's interceding for you between you and God. That you can run to Him and He will grip you with His mercy and grace. And so out of this time, here, here's what it means is this. In uncertain times, Jesus is the anchor for your soul. And, and I just want to encourage you in a few ways. You see, I, I understand what it's like to, to be shaken by the world. I understand what it's like to see the words on the paper, hear it from a message, but still question, God, can I still trust you? I know it says so in your scripture, God, but, but can I trust you not only when I'm sitting down and reading scripture, but can I trust you in my everyday life? Can I trust your promise? And here's what I would say to that is that your faith can only be as strong as the object that you have faith in. And so if you really want to grow in your faith with Jesus, it's not to sit back. It's not to just... Um, hope for more faith the, the key to it is to get to know Jesus better to, to spend more of your time with Jesus think about relationships when you first meet someone in your business or you meet somebody on the playground or you meet somebody there's this tendency to hey can I trust you but the more time you spend around them, you will either learn that you can trust them more or you will learn to guard your heart. And I think that Jesus, as he says, I'm the anchor for your soul, I think he's inviting us to trust him more. And these were just off the top of my head, but, but here's what it means. Can, can you imagine if you knew scripture so well, if you looked at Jesus so deeply, that when you became afraid, the first thing that would pop into your mind would be Matthew 10, 29 through 31. It says this, 
Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father? But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not. Therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. I mean, can you imagine if you, when you're afraid and those words of Jesus would come at you and say, hey, remember, you're more valuable than the sparrows? What, what about this? What about in those times of your life where, where you're just exhausted? And you're trying to do everything and you're trying to keep up and it just feels like there's not enough time in the day and, and you're just kind of feeling the pressure and you feel like you might explode. Can you imagine what would happen if in that moment as you get to know Jesus more, you would hear these words reminded to you by the Holy Spirit, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What about this? What about the times where you're anxious in heart? Where the anxiety has, seems to kind of just creep into, to, into your heart and just sit there. Can you imagine what it would be like to, to hear Jesus' words come, come rushing at you out of Matthew 6? Here he says, Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. God knows what you need. You don't have to have this fear of missing out. God knows what you need beforehand, but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these will be added unto you. What about this one? What about when you see that there's no way through? Where you're looking at this pandemic or you're looking at your marriage or you're looking at your job situation and you're saying, God, I don't see a way through this. I, I don't see. Can you imagine what it would be like to to hear Jesus' words, to say this, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And there's no, when it doesn't seem like there's a way that Jesus is saying, you know what, I've got your life. I'm here to give you life abundantly. What about this? What about when, you, when, when sorrow overwhelms you? Where it just paralyzes you. Where you can't even move. How incredible would it be to, to hear God's, to hear Jesus whisper these words, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring you to remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. See, Jesus is the anchor of our souls. And as we learn more and more about Jesus, these, these words that he spoke get lodged deeper and deeper into our hearts so that when pressure comes, those words spill out into our lives. What about this? What about when you feel alone? I know that it's been a hard season for a lot of people, especially if you're single, living by yourself. Or, or maybe you're a single parent. You get home from work and you have no one to talk to except for your kids. But man, how you wish there was an adult that you could spend some time with. There are moments where you just feel like there is nobody even seeing you. How amazing is it to, to know that Jesus says that he will never leave you. Look at what he says. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, 
I'm with you always to the very end of the age. God will never leave you. What about, what about this one? What, what about when you really begin to realize your mortality? What if you begin to, to, to realize like you will see death? I've joked a little bit about it. I, I turned 40 this year and I kind of feel like I've just been hurt since I turned 40. I don't know if you ever felt like that, but I saw a meme the other day. It says, when you turn 40, your check engine light comes on. You see, whether it's taken suddenly from us or we live to die of natural causes, sometimes that overwhelms us. But Jesus reminds us, he says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who, believe, who, who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? That's my question for you today. Do you believe that? I want to encourage you, if you've never surrendered your life to Christ, I want to encourage you to do that. I just want to encourage you, go to God in prayer right now and just say, God, I've been trying to do this on my own and, and I just can't do it on my own anymore. God, I need you. I, I've sinned against you. I have sinned against other people. God, I need your forgiveness. God, will you forgive me? I want to encourage you after praying that, I, I want to encourage you to find a church to get baptized in. And if it's southeast, let us know. We'll baptize you immediately. But if not, if you're worshiping from a distance, maybe another country or another state, I want to encourage you to find a local church where they'll baptize you. But here's the thing is, in certain times, Jesus is the anchor for your soul. And we see that played out by the words of Jesus. We see that played out because... He gives us peace when our hearts are anxious. We see that played out because we, we recognize that He delivers us when there's no other way. We, we, we don't have to be tossed to and fro by, by the waves of whatever's happening at the moment. Jesus is the anchor of our soul. and that He can give us peace beyond understanding. I'm going to pray right now, and while I pray, the worship team is going to come up. We're going to sing a song, and then we're going to receive communion together. I'd love for you to receive communion with us. If, if you're a believer, if you've surrendered your life to Christ, we would love to invite you to, to join us in this part of the worship service. And so right now, I want to encourage you to go get the bread or the juice or the elements that you're using for communion. But right now, let me just pray for you. Father God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. God, we thank you that you have not abandoned us. God, we thank you that we can trust your promises. God, we thank you that we can look back and we can see a track record of your faithfulness to your people. And God, I know that it's, it's hard right now for some people. They're waiting. They're, they're they're in these moments, they're in this darkness and they don't see your hand moving and they don't see anything going on and they're just wondering and they're questioning. And God, I just pray that you give them peace as they're patiently waiting for you to fulfill the promise in their life. God, I pray that you would just give them patience. Father, you are good to us. You are kind to us. You are merciful to us and you're grace pours over onto our lives and for that we give you praise in Jesus name, Amen On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross is the emblem of suffering 
of service where we receive communion. The bread represents Jesus' body, which was crucified. The juice represents Jesus' blood, which covers a multitude of sins. Before we receive the elements, I want to encourage you, go to God in prayer and prepare your heart to receive communion. This might look like something like this. Maybe, maybe you go to God in prayer and you say, God, you know what? I've been put in something else on the throne of my heart. God, you have not <laughs> been the anchor of my soul. God, I have felt just tossed about in these last few days, in these last few weeks, these last few months. And God, I'm sorry. For others of you, God, you, you've recognized that God is the anchor of your soul. With, without God, you would have been a mess, but you're recognizing, wow, God, I'm so grateful that you've seen me through this. But it, where, wherever you are in your spiritual journey, I want to encourage you, just go to God in prayer. Prepare your heart to receive communion. on the relationship that we have with Christ as we partake in the, the bread and the juice and we're reminded of that anchor of our soul we are reminded that there are those around us who do not have that anchor can you just take a moment and pray for someone that you know that needs to surrender their life to Christ it might be a family member or it might be Friend, it could be a coworker. It might even be you. Would you just pray that they would surrender? Paul 
writes to the church in Corinth about the Lord's Supper, about communion. He instructs, he instructs them this way. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Go ahead and eat the bread. In the same way also he took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me go ahead and drink the juice Paul goes on to say for as often as you drink the bread as, as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes pray. Father God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. God, we thank you that you took upon our sin and you were crucified. You died in our place. We thank you that your blood covers our sins. God, we thank you that you rose from the grave. That you have given us life. Name, amen. Okay, now's the, the time in our service where we receive the offering, and I want to encourage you uh, to continue in worship by giving your offering. Um, if you go to www.southeast.cc backslash give, uh, you can you can give your offering there. But also, if you need help, let us know. We can't help you unless we know, um, and you can do that on our website as well. Um, don't forget to fill out your communication card. It's online, www.southeast.cc backslash sermons. Uh, coming up next, we have Kids Zoom. Um, that's on our sermon page, so you can click on the link. And if somebody, if one of you is watching, would you just post that link also in the Facebook or YouTube or wherever it is that you're watching? That'd be fantastic. And then don't forget to check the website out often. Um, updates. And just a reminder, we are going to invite you to come gather, if you feel comfortable, to come gather for worship on June 7th. Next week is a very special worship service. It's the Global Day of Prayer, and you're not going to want to miss it. Um, and with that, I, I saw this and I thought, I'm, I just want to close the service with this. Um, this is a prayer uh, by Ken Geyer. Here's what he says. Help me to understand that it is an intimate moment you seek from me. Not an elaborate meal. Guard my heart this day from the many distractions that vie for my attention. And help, my, help me to fix my eyes on you. Not on my rank in the kingdom, as did the disciples. Not on the finer points of theology, as did the scribes. Not on the sins of others, as did the Pharisees. Not on the place of worship, as did the woman at the well. Not on the budget, as Judas did. But on you. Bring me out of the kitchen, Lord. Bid me to come to your feet. And there may I thrill to sit and adore you. Amen. God bless. Have a wonderful week, everybody.